Assalamualaikum and good evening. Welcome you all to our regular Zoom-based activities of the Oncology Club. This is Dr. Shahana Farvin from National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital. Today we are the addressing the challenges and the opportunities what we have in our the medical college hospital. And as you know, the our the medical college hospital they have the only that they are mainly with their obstetric and gynecological patients in spite of that they have to the uh, deal the oncological gynecological oncological patients and our the general gynecological gynecologist they are treating their patient as far as they can and our medical college today's presenting medical college is my machine medical college and hospital and the Faculty students are Professor Dr. P. K. Shekran Sir. Sir is the head of the department, Gaini and Ops, PBS Hospital in Calicut, India. Another faculty is Professor Dr. U. D. Bafna Sir. Sir is the head of the department, BM Join Hospital, Bangalore. And previously, Sir was the head of the department of the Kidoi Memorial Hospital. And our another faculty is Professor Dr. Habuna Rai. Ma'am is the professor, Department of Radiotherapy and Ontology. Postgraduate Institute of the PGM IMER Chandigarh, India. And another faculty is Professor Dr. Taiba Tanjin Mirja. She is our the local faculty. She is the head and the professor, Department of Obstetric and Gynecology, Mamashin Medical College Hospitals. And moderator of this session is Dr. Kausan Nigar. She is assistant professor of obstetric and gynecology, Mamashin Medical College Hospital. And the today we have the two presenters, Dr. Ishad Jahan Sorna, she is the trainee on the Ops and Gaini in Mamashin Medical College. And another is Dr. Priyanka Rai, she is also the registrar and trainee in Mamashin Medical College. And we have the another, we have the another presenter today, she is Dr. Mahmuda, she is registrar of Ops and Gaini Department in Sar Solimula Medical College Hospital, and she will present a case what was previously discussed in this session, that was the pre pregnancy with the hyperthyroid, the huge abdominal mass, and that uh, again, this pa patient will be discussed in the after the discussion of their cases in Mamashi Medical College. So today we have with our scientific secretary, Dr. Ethan Kamaluddin. Dr. Kamaluddin is scientific secretary of the Oncology Club. We have the Professor A. M. M. Shurikulalam, sir. Sir is the general secretary. And our inspector always sees with us, that's Professor Dr. Amy Hai, sir, he's the president of the Oncology Club. I request all of you to save the date because after two years, we are going to organize the again the our the Bangladesh International Cancer Congress 2020. We previously yearly we organized the session, but due to the COVID pandemic, we didn't arrange the session, but we think we hope that we can arrange the session this time in person and event of the Oncology Club Bangladesh, and it will be on 17th and 18th November 2020. And in the Army Golf Club, Dhaka, and the, all the participants here are requested for the registration and join the sessions. And at last, the supporting the fighters, admiring the survivor and honoring the, the taken and the never ever giving up hope. So we think if we can continue this, we can help our the poor, the cancer patients. And now, I request our the faculty, um, uh, faculty, the local faculty, the professor Dr. Taiba Mirja and professor head of the department, Mamashi Medical College Hospital, to give his the opening remarks and the opening the um, introductory the uh, introductory speech of her medical college, what she had done in the last COVID, the 2022. Professor Dr. Taiba Mirja, madam. Hey, 
respected faculties, learned audience, home Aapna, and at After special hoy ni. I am sorry that the, we have the another faculty today is Professor Dr. Joya Ghosh. And I didn't include it because she didn't confirm me at first, Professor Dr. Joya Ghosh. She is the head department of the medical college, not the head. She is the professor department of medical college in Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And she is the dealing the breast and the gynec oncology in Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Yeah, good evening, Dr. Sana. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yes, sir. Can I possibly be facing some problem? Sir, over the connected Hamela person, only keep the two person for my message, but at the Get anybody who can help them. May the Nizi meet her so. A pop name, share his skin, put the panda, and I'm a male for an amic. Respected faculty, um, learning to them, whomever, good evening. Dr. Sona. 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 Dr. Kilometer far from Dhaka city. It is one of the busy hospital in Bangladesh. Every day, so around on one twenty two hundred patients are admitted in Ghana and Ops department. Slide to change an upper. Momshin Medical College was awarded last year. This this stood fast. 2018, 2019, 2020. Total admitted patient every month, 3,500. Last, last year, total admitted patient, 393. Common patient is Carcinoma service, 270. Incidence of the carcinoma service in Mamishi Medical College, 67%. Carcinoma worry, 23%. Company sneak peek of all malignancy last year. Cancer-related service uh, says we can provide to them cancer screening, 
diagnosis staging grading surgery to some extent and cancer research limitation we are facing regarding management of malignancy lack of separate gynae oncology department lack of uh, efficient running of radiotherapy machine lack of office as well as palliative care soon dream will come true cancer kidney and cardiac disease unit is going established as specialized hospital in mamshi very soon there thank you Thank you, Dr. Taiba Mirza. Now I request the our moderator of the today's session, Dr. Kausar Nigar, to moderate the session. Dr. Kausar Nigar, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, you, madam for giving me the, the opportunity. Assalamualaikum. Very, very good. 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 राइट we are very much delighted that our institution mamsing medical college will press two interesting cases in such a prestigious forum first of all i like to request dr priyanka roy to present her case she completed her postgraduate degree that is ms in obgyn recently and working as registrar in mmch dr priyanka roy thank you madam i am sharing my screen Am I audible? Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, you are. You are yes. Visible. Yes. Respected teachers and my learned audience from home and abroad, adab, and very good evening. Now I'm presenting my case. She is 30 years old, having one living child. attended a gynecologist on march 2021 with amenorrhea for 7 months with symptoms of pregnancy an ultrasonography of uterus and adnexa revealed gestational problematic disease with molar changes and at that time her serum beta hcg level was 14840 ml international unit per ml after this suction and evacuation was done on 27th march 2021 in a private hospital In 48 hours after her suction evacuation, her beta hCG level was more than 8,000 mL international unit per ml, and on 1st April it was more than 10,000 mL international unit per ml. Then chemotherapy with methotrexate was started outside Mamsi Medical College Hospital without any documentation of WHO prognostic scoring. After 10 days of her fourth cycle chemotherapy, she developed severe lower abdominal pain and paravaginal bleeding. Mm -hmm. And admitted into Mamsi Medical College Hospital with shock on 20th June 2021, and diagnosed as a case of hemoperitoneum, probably due to perforating mold. Immediately, resuscitation and laparotomy followed by repair of right front of uterus done immediately. Then she complained about hemoptysis and irregular perivaginal scanty bleeding, but no documents of vitality reports was available from June to August 2021. She again received five cycle chemotherapy with methotrexate up to October 2021, and the, uh, the available BTCG reports are shown as follows. On 13 September 2021, it was 2 lakh 43 thousand, and on 17th October 2021, it was 1 lakh 23 thousand, and on 13th October 2021, it was above 1 lakh 11 thousand. That is seven months after starting of methotrexate therapy. The BTCG level remained above one lakh. On chest X-ray posterior interview on 13 September revealed no active pulmonary lesion. Thereafter, oncologist switched to imago chemoschedule from 14 November 2021, and total eight cycle imago therapy was given up to 31st March 
And during the IMACO schedule, her obituary reports are as follows. On 8 February 2022, it was 27,000 about. And on 22nd February 2022, it was about 58,000. On 9th March 2022, it was about 31,000. And 21st March 2022, it was 81,747. And on 5th April 2022, it was 1,10,000. And on test X-ray posterior interview done on 21st March 2022, revealed solitary pulmonary nodule in the left lung. He was declared as methotrexate resistant gestational diagnostic neoplasia with lung metastasis and referred to obstetrics and gynecology department for further management. But she lost follow up for one month and again admitted into Miami Medical College Hospital on 8th May 2022. And her BTACG level was at that time above 3 lakh. That is on 24th April 2022. After admission, proper evaluation, we found she is mildly anemic. All other vitals were normal. Uterus was enlarged, about 20 weeks in size, antibiotic, harm to heart in consistency, non tender, and feast. No nodule was found at vaginal wall. These are the investigation reports that I previously said at a glance. After that, uh, we do, uh, did some uh, routine investigation. On routine investigation, as it was raised more than uh, 51 unit per liter, and serum bilirubin also raised 1.5 milligram per day. An ultrasonography of whole abdomen was done on 16 May 2022, revealed persistent gestational droplastic disease and multiple masses in the uterus, and larger mass is 5.24.5 centimeter. Hepatic metastasis, right sided mild hydroidronephrosis, mild spinomegaly. On chest test posterior interview, she was diagnosed with dense nodular opacity in both lung fields. These are the multiple dense nodular opacity and hyalur lymphadenopathy in left mid zone of lung. A CT scan of chest shows multiple nodules of different sizes noted in almost all segments of both lungs. Common secondaries in both lungs. This is the CT scan of whole, whole abdomen. And there is three hypotense face occupying lesion in the liver. My uh, larger one is 4.5 into 3.5 centimeter. Mild splenomegaly, persistent gestational diagnostic disease with hepatic metastasis, right sided mild hydrated. Right scan of brain, unremarkable. Brain. This is the WHO prognostic scoring system of our patient modified by FIGO. Our uh, total score is uh, 22, that is ultra high risk. So our diagnosis is choriocarcinoma, imaco resistant, FIGO anatomical stage score, WHO prognosis score 22, ultra high risk. Uh, and now uh, we refer the patient to National Institute of Cancer Research Hospital for further uh, management. Can you show the scoring again? We didn't get the scoring, what you are done. Yeah. Can yes, you go sir. back to the slide, slide scoring? Yes, uh, very yes. difficult case to manage as it's <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Oh. Your message to Honda Apco manager says okay. Ready to set. Oh. Interval when you are uh, seeing the patient, it was interval of 13 months. Yes, Again, uh, the HCG was very high. Again, four points. Multiple lung metastases. Uh, no, the number of metastases also to be counted. Number of metastases, again, it was more than eight, four. So, very multiple, multiple. highly advanced uh, resistant case for uh, because the treatment was not started properly at the correct time. Yes. Uh, first thing I would add uh, for a purpose of discussion. Nowadays, to have a molar pregnancy going up to seven months of maneuver is very, very, very rare. So, could you get any examination finding at the first was seen the size of the abdomen? I mean, the uterus or nothing was available. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, we didn't find the uh, patient at the time, uh, and there is no documentation of uh, uterine height at the time on the documented. Uh, okay, she lost all the all the documents. She lost probably. Okay, uh, what was which gravity she was? She was a primary or multi? 
uh, she was uh, uh, in one living cell, having one cell. Second grave at that. Yes. She was having one child. She's having one child, and uh, this was her second pregnancy. Yes, second pregnancy. Second pregnancy. Okay. So after the evacuation, what we should do actually after the evacuation? Yes. So this case has gone to very resistant sort of a situation. To avoid that, uh, for all of us to do the manage the next case uh, after evacuation, what should be our way of uh, Managing these patients. Sir, it says seven so, uh, must must have been a big uterus, maybe 20, 24, 28. We don't know because seven months amenorrhea she is giving. Yes. So maybe a big uterus. Even the momentary. primary, yeah. Even the primary uh, management may be difficult. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, yes, faster, uh, faster. Faster was done outside the uh, MIMC Medical College Hospital and patient came to me on uh, 8th May. No, it's okay. No, no. If she, if she is with you, if she is with you from the very beginning, what, how we have to go? Uh, sir, I will uh, do a ultrasonography of uterus and next and is a level. Must be, I have checked. No, that's okay. We have done the evacuation. What is the next step? This is for guidance for everyone who is listening. Then uh, we do weekly vitesis level, and if if the vitesis yeah, level this is obviously are... a big. This should have been a big uterus. It may not have been completely evacuated in the first attempt. That is the one point what we have to keep in mind. It's a seven months amenorrhea, probably five or six or seven months, maybe 20, 24 weeks. So primary evacuation it may not be complete until unless you go by the ultrasound guided evacuation, which we don't do usually. So suction evacuation may not be completely evacuated in the first instance itself. Yes. Such patients should have a, at least a ultrasound after one week or 10 days. And if it is incomplete or if there is any residual thing, you have to empty the uterus completely. At that time, you may have to do a curettage even. Primary curettage may be deferred because you are afraid of a perforation, but that may be done gently to see that the uterus is empty. So here it was a big uterus. We had assumed that it was a big uterus. And after evacuation, we didn't check whether there is uh, completely evacuated or anything is remaining. So if anything is remaining, that itself will uh, uh, go on producing a lot of HCG as well as it may be a situation where it may lead to malignant change also. I mean, the persistent condition also. So that is first thing we have to say after evacuation have an ultrasound done. It is not necessary to do a check curettage routinely. Only if it is incomplete, you have to do a next curettage and see that it is incomplete. And this yes. patient had a fetal CG follow-up. And when she was started on, from where uh, the treatment was started? Sir, uh, she went started, she went started, she started, started 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. This is the investigation report. No. No, no. There is a size of the uterus written somewhere there in that one of your slide. Twenty weeks is written. Can you decide yes, on that? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, sir. It is. Uh, Twenty weeks is. Uh, that is the, the second admission. That is uh, after sir, the second admission. Second admission on eighth May two thousand twenty. Okay, so the following some sort of a uh, chemotherapy also. Yes. Yes, sir. She was getting uh, chemotherapy and imacotherapy. Uh, she was getting eight cycle imacotherapy. Imo After that, when she uh, there was lung. No, what was she given yeah. initially? What was the chemotherapy given? Sir, she was uh, uh, referred on uh, imaco. After imacotherapy, she was referred to obstetrical and gynecological department for further management. Then she admitted in our. No, no. Before that, no, no. To know the case before that, what was I think she was given. Method said earlier, how many courses? Method said given total nine cycle from before Imako. I may should take a pathata bolin. Put the bottom bar, put the question for a whole set. After a class, I think the data shrunk to bolin, sarke, buji bolin. Put on the deck and slide, put on the deck and up. Okay, okay. So let us see again from the very beginning for a proper question. So just uh, you trust uh, just not from Western is molar change. That is the initial one with the 14,000 HCG even before evacuation. 
suction cure strategy was done and then uh, what was missing probably whether to check whether it was completely evacuated or not was yeah, missed probably that was the one reason for this very high level hcg going up after the evacuation also we expect the hcg to be lower uh, if the evacuation is complete and uh, then if it goes up they will know it is going for gta so she was uh, given methotrexate uh, or cycles Yes, sir. Okay. Of course, Without the WHO scoring, we will prefer to make it as a FIGO scoring because yes, WHO has been most modified by this FIGO. Now, what is the score is of FIGO? Okay. I have to say to that because if you have put it across as a FIGO scoring now, WHO you can say modified. modified. So she had a severe lower abdominal pain and in spite of the treatment, probably we can see that uh, it was not scoring and staging was not done when we started the with the diagnosis of gtn you have to make a scoring and uh, accordingly you start the chemotherapy if it is not uh, properly selected if the initial score itself was very high say more than six then yes. in the beginning itself you may have to start the multi-agent chemotherapy yes. if it is uh, less than uh, six and below you may start even five and six may not respond to single agent chemotherapy so, but still you can try the uh, single agent, either methotrexin, which is now proved to be superior to actinomycin D or actinomycin D. One of the single agent can be given. So, cases with uh, 5 and 6 score, they may not respond well and immediately, if they are not responding, you immediately shift on to multi-agent because uh, with a low threshold for starting multi-agent therapy because that score is uh, 5 and 6 may not respond well to a single agent therapy that uh, is the thing so you should be on the watch out whether the scg is coming down and patient is responding which we are not able to see in this particular case there's no data available and again patient was uh, missing for some time and then came to your hospital by that time uh, it was uh, very high beta scg yes. uh, but it's two lakhs plus yes uh, 27,000 and then it is going on uh, that level. So yes. there again, once you come, uh, get a patient after partial treatment or treatment from outside who is not responding, again, we have to restage. That is what we have to do and find out the score. Naturally, this was a high score at the time. Once you have seen in your host hospital, she was at a very high score. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we started on imacorigy. Yes. Yes. So we started uh, uh, after nine cycles of methotrexate, patient uh, start on close switch no, no. to imaco. No, no. Oh. After coming here, did you start imaco or methotrexate again? No, no. Now, after receiving the patient from outside with this uh, history, what was done at your institution? We in MMC uh, with uh, severe lot of general pain, parvagenal bleeding. Parvagenal diagnosed. After that, uh, uh, in our hospital, oncologist uh, started chemomethotrexate. Chemo but uh, again, there was no documentation of uh, WG prognosis scoring or uh, no BTSG reports were available from June to August 2021. That is probably where we might have gone a little bit. Uh away from the uh, guideline that once you see the patient is not responding one type of treatment, restate the disease, rescore the disease and correctly select that drug. Here again, she was given methotrexate only without further staging or scoring. Okay. So probably she was in high score at that time. And if you were given the uh, multi-agent chemotherapy, she would have responded well. But while on methotrexate, she developed internal bleeding due to uh, probably invasive mode, perforation of the uterus due to invasive mode. Yes. So there it was a conservative management, no comment on that. And it can be done, conservative management can be done. But if the patient family probably along that big uterus and uh, rather than waiting for a repair and other thing, remove that uterus and then she will respond better to chemotherapy. Yes. That is the other way of looking at it. Sir, so you will get a report of yes, yes. Patient having only one living child. So 
Okay. So, is that the... Uh, uh, it's okay. That, that's okay. To leave the uterus is okay. I said in case if she's a multi, uh, with a uterus which is uh, LR, with a perforation, and uh, uh, there is uh, probably invasive mold and filled with that, uh, I mean, in the myometrium, uh, probably she will respond better if you do a structure in a multi. Then another way of looking at this case. Now, if you look back, if that was done, this patient may not have reached to this level. There's another way of looking at it. who is not responding to even multi agent. Yes. So at that time, if she's a multi, if she's a multi, again I repeat, if she's a multi, there's a place for doing hysterectomy at the time of laparotomy when she has come in a shock condition with the perforation of the uterus. You do hysterectomy, give the methotrex, I mean the chemotherapy according to the risk scoring. At least do a proper scoring after the uh, laparotomy and controlling the bleeding or after hysterectomy. Take all the way. What all things we have to do is chest x is okay for the, uh, the lung matrices to find out. Then you may, if it is positive, do the MRI drain, MRI CT scan of the liver or ultrasound of the liver to see whether there is. So there, all workout has to be done metastatic, uh, what are the sites? And accordingly, you have to score. And at that time, if it's found to be a very high score, you may have to score, go for the multi-agent therapy rather than the methotrexate again. So, uh, anybody in the this thing, Dr. Bhafna, you might have seen all such cases. Any comments and from other faculty? Yeah. I think uh, uh, if you go back to the first uh, slide again. The first slide. Yeah. Uh, because yes. you have presented it very, very fast. They were very difficult to understand. And uh, I think uh, you mentioned here uh, that the value of beta CG was more than 8,000. Okay. Yes. Uh, so very important to mention the exact value. More than 8,000 yeah. doesn't mean anything. Yes, uh, re these reports are done outside Miles Medical College Hospital. So... Oh, no. Okay. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. Madam, that is not the question. But you have okay. to request the lab to give the correct value of SCG. Yeah. Eight, more than 8,000 can be 80,000 or 88 lakhs also. So uh, it was written like 8,000. No, no. This you have to request the lab. You have to request the lab. They have to come up and give the exact value. It is possible. So uh, hereafter, you may request the lab to give the exact value rather than more than 8,000, more than 10,000. May not be helping us. It can be 10 lakhs also. But 10,000 can be... Uh, 100,000 also. So it is important to be knowing the value so that we give important. That is Dr. Bartner's uh, uh, comment on that. We have to get the exact value, which is possible. Yeah. Priyanka, sir, is yes, sir. right. Sir, is right. Somebody yes. is. So first thing I is that. I'm trying to say that if uh, we invariably, we get a type, type of report and it is more than 8,000 or more than 10,000. So please. Yes, Ask sir. them to give the correct uh, value. Request, it is possible. The lab, request the lab to write the exact value, please. It is the it is it is the message for all of us. For all of us, get this type of report like more than ten thousand, more than one lakh. It is not the actual. Please, the request the lab to write the exact the reporting. That is the message from sir. Yeah. Yes, that another, sir. Thing, another thing is that on 23rd of March, before evacuation, the beta CG value was 14,000. After evacuation on 29th, it was more than 8,000. So we don't know the exact value. And then you have measured beta CG after uh, two or three days. Okay. Now, normally, normally we don't measure it every two days. We have yeah. to do it every weekly. Okay, we don't have to do every two days or three days. Three days. Okay, how to we do uh, according to the uh, guidelines? You must do beta HCG every week. You don't have to do every day or every two days. Yes, sir. So and we have to optimize the economy the also. Time. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. yeah now you have mentioned chemotherapy with methotrexate was started. Again, you have not mentioned uh, what is the dose. Whether you are given uh, methotrexate a uh, single day. Or day one to day eight regimen. What regimen you have not mentioned here? There are many regimens available. What regimen, what dose you are given? It's very important to give proper dose. If you don't give proper dose, the patient will develop chemotherapy resistance. 
so here is very important that you mention what is the dose given here yeah. so you mentioned that uh, you she got four cycles so what kind of four cycles yes. what chemotherapy regimen was used the documents were not available yeah, yeah. even ever priyanka priyanka yes. please request your madam dr kausar nigar to state about this Kausar, I'm Kausar Nigar, my madam. Please. Uh, Head day regime or uh, daily, yes. as uh, Sir was asking? Because yes, madam. Uh, there also. are so many regimes. Head day regime, it is. Please, answer yes. it. Yes. No, she it doesn't know day. because she didn't get any paper. Patient gave the history like this. It does eight day regime, alternative methotrexate and folinic acid. Oh, but there is yes, no yes, documentation. Yes. Hey, one okay. Day, Even if it is that much is we will know it is a methotrexate folinic acid regime. So that much information we can get. The madam was giving the information that eight day regime means we know it is methotrexate folinic acid regime was given four courses. Even though uh, okay then. After coming to the higher center, then what is the thing? Yes, sir. Go on. Go on. Yeah. So after after four cycles, uh, unfortunately, I think she was lost for follow up. I think yeah. uh, then she presented on 20th June with hemoperitoneum. So obviously, yeah. I think patient is not responded to chemotherapy or chemotherapy was not given properly. That's why she has come to you with a massive disease. She has come to you with yeah. hemoperitoneum. Okay. That means she has not responded to chemotherapy at all. Okay, then she had laparotomy followed by repair of right corno of the uterus was done immediately. Okay, the next, next, next slide. Then she had complained about hemoptysis post-operatively, I think. And uh, no documentation of beta CG was available. Again, she received five cycles of chemotherapy with methotrexate. This is, that is another mistake. She has not responded yeah. to methotrexate. Again, you are second time also you are given methotrexate. Okay, when we already know that patient is not responded to methotrexate, we should have chosen a combination chemotherapy or should have chosen different single agent chemotherapy like actinomycosin D. So here, I think the second mistake which was done was to use same chemotherapy. Okay. And I think the yeah. beta we have the risk score also. If a risk scoring was done directly, we would have gone to multi agent. The scoring has to be done. Once uh, the patient has come from outside, after the initial life-saving surgery, then score the patient, state the disease with the proper uh, investigation. Then only we can decide on the chemotherapy. Now she has come from outside after uh, methotrexate and then developed hemopetronal. You have saved the patient by doing a laparotomy and repair. And after that, before starting methotrexate, which drug she will respond? Whether it is single agent or multi agent, which depends on the stage and the score of the disease. So, that is very mathematical derivations of management in such cases. So, that is the, as Dr. Wahman was telling, that is the second place where we have gone wrong. We yeah. should have re stage and re scored the disease, and probably it would have been a multi agent therapy which would have started that. Then, five cycle means almost 10 weeks, two and a half months are lost, yeah. and the disease was not responding. And she became actually more uh, worse than more what it was earlier. So that is where we are again gone wrong in that way. This, it, is, it is all we are discussing uh, where to uh, save the patient, such patients in the future. That's why. Again, Dr. sir, continue. <laughs> yeah, again, uh, this is one more thing you can see from the chart is that the beta SG le levels uh, have fallen from 2,43,000 to 1,23,000 and then 1,23,000. 11,000. Okay. Whenever you are giving chemotherapy, normally we expect a log fall. You should always have a log fall, yeah. initially at least. Suppose the value was 100,000. After one cycle, the value should be 10,000. 10,000. 1 lakh should become 10,000. That is a good response to chemotherapy. Okay. And almost always, almost always, you will get a log fall if a patient is responding to chemotherapy. If there is no log fall, then I think you have to change chemotherapy immediately. In this case, a uh, uh, patient is not having log fall. Okay, a patient has again the values are plateauing. In spite of the plateauing, I think she received again five cycles of methotrexate. I think we should yeah. have changed chemotherapy immediately. 
So log fall so is very, very important in gestational trophoblastic disease. Gestational you always aim for log it's fall. So that is also important. You have to see that the value comes 1 in 10 than the previous. That is 1 log means 1 in 10. It is 1, 10 times less. 10 right. times less. That is a fall by 1 log. At least 50% fall in that uh, previous value has to be seen. Or 30% minimum. Then only you can continue with it. Otherwise, you have to immediately say that no, this patient will not respond to my treatment and I have to go for somewhere else or some other treatment. So that was the second thing. Without restaging, rescoring, the same drug was given. And you took five courses, which means 10 weeks or more than that, means two to three months are lost there without any response to the treatment. Now, again, she had a secondaries in the lungs, which is there in the very beginning, or this was uh, becoming less, I think. I think responded partially. But the beta ICG has gone up one lakh. That is uh, last month. So this is the final stage now. What she is? Next slide. What the question? GTN. She lost for one month again. No, no. What is the next one? That's last last year. They we have reached. Last year they next one. Okay. This is the from the very beginning. Okay. Next. Uh, next. Okay. That's all. Right. Uh, next. Uh, this was all there initially. So, as Dr. Waffen was telling, we would have changed the drug as per the stage and the score at the time of, uh, after the laparotomy, life-saving laparotomy. That's a good step that we could save the patient from dying in general hemorrhage. That can be a very severe hemorrhage. And you could save the uterus also. That is also a congratulatory thing uh, because she has not completed the family. But immediately after that, you should have restaged and rescored the patient. And instead of starting methotrexate again, gone for multi agent therapy, she would have re responded better. Now, in March, uh, uh, in April, uh, by that time, it was five courses after the surgery also, isn't it? Yes. Well, we are sir. difficult to follow. Sir, sir, we, 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 sir we have medical oncologists sir, with have us. <coughs> no, 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 I am not uh, telling gynecologists or oncologists no, 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 or no, uh, anybody. We, yes, sir, we can whoever hear. It is, yeah. Whoever it is, we have to be going by the scientific evidence and uh, exactly. as per the protocol. Whether it yeah, is. Can, uh, you, can you go back to the anyway, MACO? This is, the MACO was started in this patient. It's already received, the MACO, sir. Yeah, now see, now no, see, see, here you can see the MACO. See, when you started EMACO on 14, 11, 21, she has already become resistant to EMACO regime, as you can see from the beta HCG value. Yes. Beta okay. HCG value have not fallen at all. In fact, in fact they are varying. 27,000, 58,000, 31,000. That means she is not responding to EMACO regime at all. She has become resistant uh, to EMACO. Eight course of EMACO was given. That is usually we stop with the five or six. But she had received even eight course of MACO. That is again, I think she has tolerated the uh, regime very well because eight course of MACO is not a job. And uh, she is still having a very advanced disease with a score of 22. You, you, now you are scoring it? Yeah, yes. Are you scoring after the MACO? Yes, sir. For MACO, we have scored. At the time of Vaco, uh, now what is the stage? Now again, responding. She is not responding. As Dr. Waffen was telling, she is resistant to Vaco also. Now again, to yes. see that is a very high score. What to do? Yes. Sir, what will be the further management? Oh. We can hear from Dr. Joya Ghosh. Professor Joya Ghosh, sir. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do, uh, I think that's a very interesting case. And as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shekharan was mentioning, uh, that uh, uh, you know, we uh, might have changed you know, to uh, Imaco. Uh, I mean, Imaco to Ima EP when you know there was no log fall in Imaco, so we could have gone ahead and changed to Ima EP. So presently, I think yeah. she has extensive uh, disease and has already and quite has resistant. Already quite... So what we so would want to do is, uh, uh, if she is at a very high risk, she is of at a very high risk. Of 
uh, we can give uh, uh, we can give uh, uh, that is this platinum yeah. uh, that is this platinum uh, and uh, as a preface because uh, she's already uh, quite resistant and extensive lung meds that you showed and so then and then move on to uh, giving her something like ima ep is what i would think to do okay okay it is good now only thing is uh, please change the lab for the beta hcg also in spite of eight course imaco uh, the patients usually, uh, because this is following a molar pregnancy, it's not following a normal delivery. So usually they should have, but here it has become resistant because of the delay in the treatment, because of the improper uh, chemotherapy selected. Uh, that is also reason for going for such a uh, resistant case. But uh, still, you must yes, check sir, the properly. Yeah. Uh, in the entire career of 35 years, uh, I never seen such a case, totally frankly. Uh, yeah, patient not responding to MACO, very, very unusual. Yeah, very, very, very unusual. That to following a molar pregnancy. So, I think she may be up. initially she had multiple lung metastasis. The last chest x ray or something has shown only one nodule or so. So, that means she is responding probably. So, check the beta CG from another lab and request them to give the accurate value. Either in a central lab for us to have the value taken, or it is uh, different different places. So please request them to go in for the uh, actual level. I how is the patient doctor who was presenting? Have you seen this patient? Sir, she yes, sir. I've seen this patient. She sir, beta CG. No, no, patient. How is the patient? Yes, sir. Yes, how sir. Is the patient. Patient is referred to NICRH and today. No, no, no. Did you see this patient at any yes, time? Yes, sir. What is her condition now? Is so her patient, what is her condition? General condition is what patient is has homoplasis, patient is not very uh, well, and patient uh, is referred to NICRH and today morning patient uh, has admitted patient, in NICRH. Our, our doctor, our, Dr. Doctor. Ruksana, are you here, Ruksana? Ruksana, who was yes, presenting the case, so might have seen the case. The patient is anemic? Yeah, we is she severely anemic. anemic? Yes, sir. She is a moderately anemic. Her Moderately is... only, not very yes, severely. She no, was sir. looking ill at this time? Yes, sir. Her echo score is 2. During her examination. Okay. Her examination. No, sir. I was just checking because whether sir, our beta patient... acid is correct. Yeah. Sir, patient has the beta acid is correct. Oh. Sir, patient has transfused two units of packed cell in Mymising Medical College where she was in Mymising Medical. Then, then she okay. became mildly anemic. Initially, she oh, was no. moderately anemic and two units of blood transfusion was given. Hmm. No, she has also hemoplasis. She has also hemoplasis, respiratory distress, and she has also the liver mats. Not only the lung mats, she has also the liver mats and she has the hemoplasis. So that is why I think, you know, because of liver and lung meds and if she's having active hemopsis, if you give her that full EMIP, she might, uh, so we can, pro because she's never received cisplatinum in etoposide, I would consider giving her maybe just two days of cisplatinum in etoposide and seeing how she's responding to that. And, you know, then consider, you know, change over to the EMIP. And I think someone had asked in the chat someone box, had asked in the chat box. Uh, why no... Um, uh, hysterectomy, but she already has liver and lung meds, so I th don't think there is a role for hysterectomy at this juncture when she has such extensive uh, metastatic disease. Yes. I agree I with that uh, because... The patient uh, has become resistant uh, to almost all the drugs. So, so I don't yeah. think she uh, uh, respond to any drug at all. Whatever you do, I don't think she's going to respond. Uh, because she because, has got extensive uh, disease. Uh, and this is how the initial... Management of the case is important. The initial selection of chemotherapy and the, whether she is responding to that chemotherapy, whether you should go for another chemotherapy, all those things uh, are going to count the success rate of treating. The eminently curable condition that we have to see, it is unlike the other cancer. Uh, this is a very well curable condition. So we miss the chance of uh, treating her properly from the very beginning. That yes. is why I am uh, very much concerned about that way. And uh, several places we missed the opportunity of uh, proper treatment of this patient. 
Yes. So I will start from the evacuation. Then the check evacuation, if it was necessary to make it completely evacuated because it is seven months of minor, actually five months of minor, yeah. maybe a big uterus. It is not possible to completely evacuate. Anything remaining there will become a, a neoplastic for a long time if it is lying there. Then uh, proper follow-up with the CG with the correct value rather than more than 10,000, we have to get the correct CG values. Then selecting the proper drug as per the staging and scoring. If it is staged up to three, that is lung, with the score of six and below, you can choose single agent even if it is five and six. But if they are not responding, immediately switch over to multi-agent. That is the teaching now. Or at least when she comes with uh, uh, not responding at that stage, at least we should have changed as per the proper scoring. Whenever the patient is readmitted, we have to do a staging and scoring again and select the proper drug. As Madam was telling, now probably you may try MIEP and cisplatin. Madam was telling about the induction th uh, chemotherapy also if there is a lung mattress and liver mattress because it may bleed if you give again. But she responded, I mean, we stood that eight courses of IMACO, which is not a simple thing. Eight courses she withstood anyway, she is still there with her mattress. So I am also doubting whether if the lung mess are only there or liver mess are going then probably you may have to recheck your SCG lab with some other places. But otherwise, if it is true, then it is a very really difficult case. Somebody was raising the question of hysterectomy. Yes, I will say if the patient is that way not responding at all, if the uterus is as per the finding, it is uh, 20 weeks. I think it is now 20 weeks. And that is a burden. The chemotherapy those may not respond. In that case, hysterectomy will definitely help to cure this condition. So leave alone the family completion and other thing. If the patient is having a big uterus and if she is not responding after chemotherapy, doing a hysterectomy in these cases will also help to have a uh, help to get a remission. Uh, Dr. Bafina, your opinion on that point? Uh, yeah, obviously, I think uh, the, uh, if a patient is fit for surgery. And uh, yeah. we have, I think, uh, one or two metastases in the liver and some metastases yeah. in the lung. If at all you want to try chemotherapy, we we'll try to remove the uterus, I feel. By uh, removing, uh, yeah. uh, no, by removing yeah. the uterus, I think uh, probably the disease burden would come down and chemotherapy might yeah. act better. But uh, I think this yeah. patient is very difficult uh, to manage. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to uh, differ on that, uh, is that uh, she has uh, such extensive has lung such and liver metastasis yeah. that, you know, removing the hysterectomy at this juncture uh, will not really help her because, uh, you know, she will have, you know, in, uh, progression at uh, in the lungs as and it will also be very difficult to perform the hysterectomy. Occasionally, yeah, yeah, we've yeah, had uh, patients uh, okay. with, uh, you know, a single lung or a liver metastasis with a lung or the liver metastasis is just very small. In that situation, we have tried hysterectomy. In some of those patients, it has helped. But in others, you know, what has happened is within three months of doing a hysterectomy, you know, if there were just two or three lung mets and it was uterus, which was the major site of disease, not this kind of patient with florid mets and hemopsis. So even in those patients, you know, they start progressing again in the lungs. So I, in her case where there is so much of lung and liver metastasis, I think, you know, a hysterectomy at this juncture will not help her. You know, at an earlier juncture, if she had uh, just one or two meds there, yes. But now with such florid disease, uh, I agree that, you know, if such patients may not respond even to EMIP. But I think but then because she's young and it's still a GTN, it would be worth giving her EMIP some at least. Uh, I mean, the chances of cure to uh, go down to. Uh, go down to uh, I think the last, last CT, last, last CT says only one nodule. No, That's sir, why no. I said there may be a place. And no, the uterus sir. is 20 week size. That is what is written. No, sir. The, sir there is sir. one nodule, and the uterus is 20 weeks, and she was given eight course of uh, IMACO. In that situation, as a last result, to remove that load, burden of the disease, there may be a place in this desperate case. I say this is yes. a desperate case. 
sure sir if there is oh, one okay. nodule and uh, the uterus is the site that we would go for hysterectomy but what they had shown yes. is that after a macro there were liver mats multiple yes, and yes. extensive lung mats and hemopsis and therefore yeah. i said that in the current scenario okay. now uh, it's very difficult not... very difficult situation yes you are correct it's very difficult but i could see in that percentage somewhere one nodule and few mets and the uh, uterus was 20 weeks and she is not yes. responding there may be a place even with the one yes, child sir. it is okay to mm -hmm. remove that uterus at least she has got one child so, so uh, we have slipped down 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 from a situation oh. of uh, complete cure to a desperate situation now that is what we have to learn from this case from the very beginning we have to be careful in such cases because uh, again, it is unfortunate she had to go up to seven months to make a diagnosis, which is uh, not seen nowadays, uh, actually, because uh, it is easy that they do not come for antenatal care at any time. No, sir. They didn't need to check up on the period. No, they didn't, she didn't came to antenatal care. Yeah. Just she do the urine pregnancy test by Steve herself at home and we found it positive. So at that month of seven, she came to for, for an ultrasound and came to the gynecologist. No, no, I am not talking about this particular patient. She may be maybe the social condition, social economic condition. We are touched up there. Yes, sir. Now, generally, when they know that they are pregnant, what is the practice? I mean, what is the practice of the people there, whether they will be coming to a hospital or a facility to have some checkup rather yes, than sir. not coming at all. What is the percentage uh, that you may see in the hospital, say, if they yes, are sir. Yes, sir. Nowadays, usually uh, they come, I think. You, you, nowadays, usually they take antenatal care at they least come. four. They come. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. At least four antenatal checkup are taken by them. Uh, I, yeah. and eight, uh, yeah, nowadays, our protocol is eight antenatal checkup. They yeah. are coming, but okay. this is the unfortunate patient and uh, she lost off and on. This is our um, unfortunate. Uh, this is, this unfortunate. is again our socioeconomic condition of our countries. Uh, we are also finding some corners of our country also the same problem exists. So they may not come for checkup. So I was just checking uh, whether uh, they are in spite of the social factor because of the awareness that they have to have the checkup. Are they not coming for uh, some medical advice when they are, know that they are pregnant is my question. Uh, this happens in India also in many of our uh, states. The remote places they may not come for a checkup even though facilities are available it is not uh, the availability may be there the acceptance are not there sometimes that is also the tragic thing so again awareness and education is the key to help them that is one side second side is our way of going and looking after such patients in the very set pro protocol is the and then this is, uh, and here we don't know, as Madam was telling, uh, extensive, and uh, you try all sorts of chemotherapy with the blood transfusion and support, and try to get again. If the brain is not showing any match so far, yeah. that is one uh, thing. It's no, it's, no, uh, no. It is not showing. Uh, liver match, uh, I think it was one or two was mentioned, and last scan, somewhere it was said only one nodule. Initially, it was multiple, we could see. So she responded partially to the IMACO, but it was not a good response. We should have seen that by four or five or so, we should have seen the beta CG comes down, the shadows will disappear, and then we can continue to six courses. Here we have gone up to eight courses and still it is worse. And uh, hence, uh, before that itself, as Madam was telling, MIP may be better in such cases, or if it is a big burden of the tumor burden is there, uh, induction chemotherapy and then going for other things, so all those things. Now, I am uh, uh, not in a position to say, as Madam was telling, what she said is correct. You can go for MIP regime. Okay, sir. Sir, we, we, have, two we, have, we have two more cases. Okay. May I please go through okay, the Okay, thank you. We'll yes, stop sir. it here. Uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir, yeah. and other faculties to enrich us with knowledge regarding Another the case, case, please. Next case. case. Next case. Your next case. <laughs>
Yes, Prenum. Now, it is the time for Dr. Isra Jahan Sharna. She completed FCPS in OBGN and working as indoor medical officer uh, sincerely. She will talk about an uncommon case. Please, Isra Jahan Sharna, please present your case. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Next slide. Please. Are my slides visible? Yes. Respected faculties, respected teachers, and dear audience from home and abroad, Assalamu alaikum. I would like to start my case. Mrs. X, 55 years, menopausal lady with four living children who presented with a five months history of foul smelling pervasional watery discharge, lower abdominal mass, generalized weakness. She had early satiety and no other history of gut discomfort like loose stool or constipation. She had no urinary complaints. On clinical examination, there was a large non-tender ill-defined abdominal pelvic mass with marked ascites and an ulcerative cervical growth which bleeds on touch with evidence of involvement of parametrium and no rectal involvement. Lower third of vagina was apparently normal. Investigation findings are given below. Important is ESR 80 in first hour. Prothombin time epididy were normal. Tumor markers all were raised. C125 was 1,883.7 unit per liter. C99, 4,231.37 unit per liter. Persino embryonic antigen, 321.5 nanogram per deciliter. Ultrasonogram of whole abdomen revealed a complex cystic mass with solid component a cervical mass with a thickened heterogeneous endometrium and marked ascites. CT abdomen revealed large cystic mass 12.4 into 11 centimeter arising from right ovary, solid mass inseparable from uterus 8 into 8 centimeter and marked ascites. Bipes of cervix was invasive squamous cell carcinoma break 2 and ultrasound guided cytopathology of ovarian mass was squamous cell carcinoma. This patient was diagnosed as cervical carcinoma stage 2B with ovarian mass and referred to National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital Dhaka for further management. Following thorough evaluation in NICRH, diagnosis remained same. Her caregiver were not keen to take treatment staying in Dhaka, thereby she took discharge on request. In the meantime, her general well-being was deteriorated and got herself admitted into my medicine medical college hospital again. Left leg was found swollen this time with complaints of cramping pain. Cuff circumference of left leg became 14 centimeter, whereas right leg was 11 centimeter. Color doctor evaluation of both lower limbs revealed extensive deep vein thrombosis in left lower limb and right sided proliferation found in chest x-ray. Multidisciplinary approach was taken. Department of Radiotherapy advised to consult cardiology for management of deep brain thrombosis before starting local regional radiotherapy. At present, she is taking care under cardiology department and she was advised to visit National Institute of Cancer Research uh, Hospital following discharge from cardiology department. Thank you for your patience hearing. Thank you, Mr. Jahan, for your brilliant presentation. Now, I like to request our faculty members to make some comment, query, or uh, suggestion from the, for this patient. Hey, I think uh, we are dealing with very advanced uh, cervical cancer. Uh, cervical cancer, which has extended to the uterus and to the ovary 
and she has also got ascites also so obviously we are dealing with the uh, stage 4 ovarian uh, cervical cancer common cell cancer and also she has got extensive uh, dvt so obviously i think uh, the prognosis would not, would not be good whatever you do so uh, i think looking at the socio economic condition and looking at the condition of the patient uh, i think uh, best supportive care would be good option for her in case uh, she is socio economically affordable uh, then i think uh, we could try palliative chemotherapy with uh, paclitaxel and carboplatinum Uh, we are confused sir is it uh, multiple primary cancer or metastatic dr bafna are we getting such extensive metastasis to the no, we don't, we don't get so we the... don't get we don't get so mm-hmm. this is obviously i think uh, they have done a fnac of uh, over and mass which yeah. also shows yeah. common cell cancer so that means same, that tumor is extended from the cervix into the uterus and the utero ovarian mass is a one single mass there is no plane between mm-hmm. ovary and the uterus so obviously we are dealing with a very extensive common cell cancer of the cervix which is spread to the ovary and to into the abdomen with ascites so this is i think basically for palliative care dr bhavna this is your comment dr bhavna please uh, yes so uh, one thing for sure is that uh, she has metastasis um, she has metastatic squamous cell carcinoma because this has, it, this has been pathologically proven however metastasis to the ovary is extremely uncommon uh, from squamous cell carcinomas as compared to the adenocarcinomas now the squamous histology has been confirmed both from the primary as well as from the adnexal mass now uh, one thing that i would also want to um, uh, you know just comment is that we do occasionally see patients with such kind of presentations but what we realize is that many a times it could be a lymph nodal mass that actually mimics an adnexal mass on an ultrasound or even on a ct scan at times and this patient also has a dvt so are we sure that we are dealing with an adnexal metastasis or an ovarian metastasis or could this be a lymph nodal mass which is causing uh, you know the dvt part also because the metastatic incidence of metastasis with squamous cell carcinoma in the ovary is less than 1% so that is one aspect and prognosis anyways remains poor in this patient and this patient if her general condition is fine definitely one should try uh chemotherapy and i would also request uh, dr jaya's opinion on the same for every she has left dr jaya she is disconnected but this patient she had the her t1 marker c125 c99 all are raised see once there is a cit c125 can be raised there has to be any peritoneal irritation that is not necessarily because of ovarian metastasis yeah so i'm just trying to say that actually there can be a picture like this where you you cannot differentiate between an adnexal mass and a huge lymph nodal mass yeah so that can also be there because incidence of squamous metastasis squamous cell carcinoma metastasizing the ovary is extremely uncommon yeah. having said that that doesn't mean that this does not occur but the first possibility should be a lymph node metastasis and ascites and the second possibility would be an ovarian metastasis from a squamous had it been an adenocarcinoma definitely i would have put forth the possibility of an ovarian metastasis much higher but the probability cn99 is also raised cn99 is also raised cea is also raised yeah now cea i would expect it to be raised in an adenocarcinoma not a squamous cell carcinoma yeah. so that is something which is uh, you know a little tricky in this patient now if we think of a primary i mean separate multi multi centric origin uh, which is unlikely because of the same pathology uh, the ovary is a peculiar organ it can have any type of cancer definitely that is uh, even the rarer types are there as you said adenocarcinoma you would have been entertained as a primary from that side only not as a secondary from this thing so probably we are not able to, but the picture of the ultrasound or the scan was showing 
typical of an ovarian tumor, not like a, uh, a squamous uh, mass there, like what we see, solid tumor. There was a cystic area there, degenerative area there in the scar. But uh, it is also proved that by histology, I mean histology, that it is uh, squamous. So very, very rare type of case. And of course, uh, DVT can occur in any cancer. But it need not be involvement of the lymphatics. DVT yes. can occur in any cancer. DVT can. Cancers, definitely. Uh, yes. so there could be one more possibility that more possibility. think of if we have to, you know, um, just think of multiple malignancies. Is there a possibility? Because this patient has ascites. Uh, has a malignant cytology been done with an IHC from the cytology? Because again, like I'm saying, there could be a possibility that we've done an FNA maybe from a nodal mass and there is an adnexal mass also. I'm just trying to think of the possibilities, yeah. you know, especially when a yeah. CEA is raised and a, yeah. Yeah, and a CA125 yeah. and a CA19.9 is raised. 9 is raised. Just, yeah. Very good, yeah. Dr. Rai, you are very correct in that way. We have to think in all the possibilities yeah. and come to a conclusion. Very good uh, discussion that way, right. Sorry, sorry, is there... Dr. Bafana, uh, do you think that it is uh, secondary only onto the... This thing. Sorry, is there any contraindication to give radiotherapy or chemotherapy uh, of DBT patient? Or radiotherapy yeah. for DVT? Sorry, sir, maybe you can answer yeah. that. And I the tumor, primary tumor for the cancer. That is the question. Yes, sir. Yes. If there is DVT, it is necessary to treat DVT first, then radiotherapy. Yes. Obviously, the, the treatment. I, I, I want to know. So, uh, can I answer regarding the radiotherapy part? Yes, and, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So, okay. see, most of the times this DVT is occurring because of the malignancy. So, you have to start the management, the management for DVT, and simultaneously you even start the treatment of radiotherapy and chemotherapy. This is unlike surgery, where the surgery has to be deferred because of the DVT. Yes. Okay. But if I mean, as far as radiotherapy and chemotherapy is concerned, both of them are not a contraindication because unless you start the treatment, your DVT is not going to respond. You are just trying to, the treatment for DVT is just being started to prevent further embolization or embolism. Okay. So the primary treatment in the form of radiotherapy and chemotherapy should be initiated. Thank you. Thank you. True. Did it do us, please? Any other question, Doctor? Question? Two more other question? So we we want to know about multiple primary cancer. Something. Yeah, I think uh, this question has already been answered uh, by Doctor Bhavna. Yeah. Uh, she has uh, said that metastasis uh, from cervix to ovary is very rare. Commercial cancer metastasizing to ovary is very rare. So you must consider primary from the ovary or from the endometrium. In this case, the endometrium also is thickened. So maybe we are dealing with endometrial cancer with metastasis to ovary or ovarian cancer with metastasis to, to, to the endometrium. Okay. But uh, we have a proof in the form of FNAC which shows uh, commercial cancer. So obviously in this particular case, uh, we are not dealing with the uh, multiple primary. We are dealing with commercial cancer of cervix. Uh, sir, can I just add on to something more? Uh, this is, I'm just talking from, you know, some of our patients that I've experienced with. Sometimes endocervical adenocarcinomas can have such kind of a presentation. So is it, I think, uh, do we have a pathology review? Because what we have is an FNAC from both the sides. So it would also be worthwhile to have a pathology review. But are we sure that we are dealing with squamous cell carcinoma only? Hmm. I think uh, there are two reports here. The cervical biopsy report also says squamous cell cancer and uh, FNAC also shows squamous cell cancer. So I think possibility of going wrong uh, should be less. Mm, yes. 
sir we are after getting the report we were confused and we go through some case report and we found a case report in africa just like this that was ovarian cancer it was squamous cell carcinoma and cervical cancer it was squamous cell carcinoma there was this case report uh, we are initially we are confused the, whether the so ovarian report is squamous cell or adenocarcinoma then we uh, consulted with the pathologist and they ensured that it was commercial carcinoma. Uh, any, any other question? Maya, please. If there is <laughs> any other question, if that is not, then we have the another case. We want to discuss that. It has already, we, we have a question. To what do, should be the ideal approach to this patient regarding further evaluation and as well as management? Uh, if, uh, we already, already question is answered by our faculties that it is only palliative. So we can uh, go to our third the third case, Dr. Hart is presented from the Sarsolimula Medical Center. And the presenter is Dr. Mahamuda. Please present your case. Mahamuda, please. Share screen. Please close the share screen. It's like a wonderful. Very good evening to all. This is Dr. Kaji Mahmoud Akhtar from Sarsulimula Medical College. So as already to Shahana Madam said that I have already presented this case and it was presented on 13th of March. So this is a, a bit a follow-up case, but for your uh, better understanding, I am just uh, telling the case in short. So uh, she was Mrs. X, a 21 years Nalipara lady, attended a local clinic on 5th January 2022 with uh, 25 weeks, six days of single alive pregnancy with breech presentation and 11 into 8 centimeter ovarian cyst. She was referred to an obstetrician and there she was further evaluated. She was diagnosed as a case of uh, hypothyroidism, TSH having 120. And she was prescribed thyroxine, which was increased gradually. And followed up at and 28, 30, and, and 30. So it is echoing. Can you please actually stop the uh, stop or mute? Someone is actually having unmute, I think. Okay, so followed up at 28, 30, and 32 weeks, and transabdominal ultrasound was done, where it was found a ovarian tumor, which was increasing rapidly. And on the 25th of February, it was found 44 into 40 centimeter. But there was no comment regarding the origin of the tumor and whether it was unilateral or bilateral. After that, the patient was referred to our hospital on the 25th of February, where uh, it was evaluated properly. And she was gravid and the uh, expected date of delivery was 14th of April. General examination finding was normal and she was asymptomatic. Uh, she, we found the patient as like that with gravid uterus and a huge uh, cystic mass in the abdomen. SH, as you can see, that it was 120 on the 5th of February, and which was uh, actually after one month, having the thyroxine 150 microgram, it was uh, more than 100. 
she was actually this she had decisional diabetes mellitus and her serum potassium was a bit uh, a bit low it was 3.3 and all the other parameters are normal regarding the electrolyte report. Her alpha fetoprotein was uh, 177, and all the other tumor markers were a bit normal, including the LDH, CO125, and others. The transabdominal ultrasound, it was reported as a hugely enlarged bilateral multiloculated cyst. And uh, they have actually uh, told that it is a bilateral uh, cyst but the size of the uh, tumor was not actually reported there. After that, we requested transabdominal ultrasound with color Doppler, but they have found uh, cyst with resistance index 0.48, and they have reported it as case of borderline ovarian tumor. So, uh, couldn't mention about the origin of the tumor and uh, reported as a case of borderline ovarian tumor. It was the MRI report, and uh, here you can see the MRI film is showing the uh, fetus was in breech presentation uh, up to 35 weeks or so, and this is the MRI report here. The cyst a bit actually uh, showing the report uh, was confusing, and they was also thinking it is a case of actually bilateral ovarian multiloculated cyst. And they also reported that there was no ascites and no pelvic invasion capillary projection within the cyst. And they, uh, they actually did the case uh, as a bilateral large multiloculated agnexal cystic uh, lesion and possibly the theca luteal cyst. But as a obstetrician and gynecologist, we deferred because it was already a 35 plus weeks pregnancy. So we diagnosed this uh, diagnosed as a case of primary 35 weeks, three days, single live pregnancy with bridge presentation with bilateral multiloculated large complex ovarian cyst with hypothyroidism, was on thyroxine and gestational diabetes mellitus on diet. And it was controlled. So we uh, actually followed the multidisciplinary team approach uh, with uh, consultation with uh, all the following doctors here and presented this case on the 13th of March in this tumor, multidisciplinary tumor board. And there the decision was like that, that if the patient uh, have any symptoms of respiratory distress or any other symptom, we can decompress the cyst, but the patient actually all together, she was uh, asymptomatic, so we didn't do that. And we, uh, and if uh, she actually, if she was a uh, primary gravid with breech presentation, so it was planned that it will be uh, actually the pregnancy will be terminated through cesarean section uh, due to the obstetric indication regarding primary gravid with breech presentation, but we were uh, following up uh, actually because she was preterm and we are expecting that after uh, minimum after 37 weeks and if uh, there is actually no respiratory distress or other things, we will just follow up her. Uh, but on the 22nd March, uh, she developed actually preterm liver and within uh, four to five hours of labor pain, she delivered with assisted vaginal breech delivery, uh, a healthy female baby, 2.5 kilograms. So after that, we followed up the patient. We consulted again with the endocrinologist regarding her uh, uh, high TSH level. And the endocrinologist advised thyroxine, uh, 75 microgram per day, and uh, advised has to discharge her uh, with continued follow-up because she had uh, no respiratory distress or any other symptoms after delivery. And after that, actually, we again uh, did an ultrasound scan just to see that is there any intercystic hemorrhage or torsion. So as there is no pain or no intercystic hemorrhage, we just discharge her with the uh, follow-up, continued follow-up. So all through uh, the follow-up, the patient was asymptomatic. And you can see that after eight weeks of delivery, she again come to us. Uh, and now you can see that the condition of that woman, and this was the previous condition after eight weeks, he has still now there is no symptom. If you can see that investigation profile, uh, her serum TSH level one was 120 on the 5th of February. And now it is 0.10 or 75 microgram. We consult with the endocrinologist and uh, they have just said continue 75 microgram until now. Her serum potassium and FT4 level until now is normal. Uh, 
uh, OGTT uh, done today, it is fasting uh, 3.7. So uh, there is no actually, uh, she's not on any medication now. You can see that alpha phytoprotein, it was 177, but after uh, delivery, uh, it is already reduced to 6.6. LDH, here it is the only report we, can, we have found that it is slightly raised. It was 148 on the 5th of March, but now it is 64. It is slightly raised. There are beta HCGs. LDH was actually slightly increased now. So, uh, considering the germ cell tumor, for the possibility of germ cell tumor, both the uh, ultrasound marker and the ultrasound features and the MRI report doesn't actually correlate, but uh, we have evaluated beta ECG, but it is only 14. CO125 also, it is 103 now. It is slightly increased uh, before it was 35. And CA99, it is 99. And you can see that uh, CA99, it is 1.40. And psyllium dynamic antigen is uh, it was uh, previously it was 6.01 and now it is 4.9. Subdominal ultrasound with color Doppler still the resistant uh, resistance index is 0.4. And here you can see the 3D image uh, showing the marginal ovarian stroma. As there is a huge ovarian cyst. Still now there is no papillary projection, no solid component of the tumor. And you can see that there is a, they have reported with the transabdominal ultrasound, large multilocular uh, ovarian cyst. This is the MRI film. With contrast, you can see that there is a large ovarian tumor. This is the MRI report. Here you can see they have reported it a multilocular and uh, they have reported that it is uh, origin is from the right at Nexa. And size is 25 in 20 and 12 centimeter with internal septation, but no solid component. And they have reported it as a case of ovarian cyst adenoma. So having these features, this is actually now open for discussion in the multidisciplinary tumor. Thank you for your patience sharing. Anna, madam. So I think Bapna sir and Dr. Joya, what is your opinion? Because this patient it was discussed in this, our the oncology club tumor board before her delivery. And it was the huge mass that was patient was hypothyroid and she got the 150 microgram uh, thyroxine. And after that delivery, she's the patient, she has no complaint, but tumor is still persisting and size is more or less the same. But only her T1 marker LD is raised and her PSA is 0 0.10, but FT4 is within the normal limit. Now, their question is what would be her treatment plan now and what should they go with this? Bapna sir and Joya, please. Dr. Joya. Before the oncologist say anything, as a gynecologist, I ask the oncologist, what is the objection of removing that tumor now? Yes, sir, I, I completely agree. For general gynecologist question, not as an oncologist. I am not an oncologist also. As a gynecologist, I am not at all comfortable leaving this patient with that tumor there. No, sir. Dr. Vahana, is there an objection for removing this mass? No objection, sir. Before you was... have the oncology discussion. Sir, on that, on that tumor board, it was presented and it was, we thought that at every the faculties, their comment was that they after delivery, it is that it is may, uh, tumor size, it will be regress and they are just patient that they admitted the last week. And so we tried to discuss the patient in this session. So, so I, I think, you know, what I, what I remember is when we had presented, the doubt was whether because the TSH was also very high, yes. uh, whether, you know, yes. that could be related to that. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but, you know, now that the TSH is also normal and uh, she is delivered, and she has this 25, uh, almost uh, a huge uh, ovarian mass. Uh, you know, why not go ahead with a unilateral selfing? Go yeah. frequently get, uh, and you know, once you do that, and I mean, Dr. Uh, Shekharan is also there. So, yeah. and after you do a unilateral selfing, go frequently, you will get a final histopathology as to whether it's benign cystadenoma 
or a borderline tumor or is there any malignancy and you know the further surgery if needed can be planned uh, based on the final pathology yes. report uh, is what i think uh, dr because, shekhar because, any, or yeah, dr. Our, our that time our recommendation was that if the after delivery the tss level when will be on bar level then the tumor will regresses and accordingly they did that and after the patient was admitted here so we are in this time we think that our, our opinion is to do the surgery with the keeping the present facilities available and even after that they want to the discuss the patient in this tumor the regression of the such a cyst uh, during pregnancy which has appeared and regression of case if it is due to beta hcg because in twin pregnancy i have seen big cysts coming and after delivery it may regress after uh, four to five weeks but uh, here it is not so it is not due to the beta hcg the occasion okay, not uh, not need not be a vascular mold to have a hcg in excess i have seen in twin pregnancies but single twin pregnancy i have seen because of the beta hcg so to wait for that here there is nothing because beta hcg also has a uh, remission is in 14 normal so i think which is such a big tumor as madam was telling that itself is a warning that it can turn into malignancy the size itself is not comfortable if it is 5 6 cm i would have waited further it is 20 plus centimeter. I think uh, we'll uh, listen to Dr. Waffe now. Do you think that it can be left there? No, no. I Dr. think uh, she has got a large ovarian tumor, which has not regressed uh, after delivery. Yeah. Initially, I thought that uh, the tumor uh, is increasing in size because of hypothyroidism. Yeah. Sometimes I have seen patients uh, who have uncontrolled hypothyroidism. You can have the ovarian cyst uh, grow very rapidly. And once uh, the... Yeah hypothyroidism is corrected, the cyst would regress in size. But in this case, after correction of hypothyroidism also, the cyst has not regressed. And patient has delivered a normal baby and uh, the cyst is persisting. And it is uh, multilocular and the septa are not very thick and there are no solid areas. So I think this uh, goes in favor of benign uh, cyst adenoma. So definitely I think she would require laparotomy and uh, I think uh, I think it's uh, going to be a benign tumor. Aproscopic yeah. removal? No. Why? No, I think uh, laparoscopy, laparoscopic removal should not be a problem. Although I think it's a relative contraindication. Whenever you have a multilocular yeah. cyst, which is a very large, more than ten centimeter. Yeah. There is a possibility of missing a small malignancy. Yes, okay. So yes, I think yes. that call you have to take, uh, whether you would like to take the risk of doing laparoscopy. But I think in this case, uh, many, many of us uh, would offer laparoscopy. Uh, because uh, uh, you do a good imaging, uh, like, like MRI scan. And MRI scan shows that uh, there are no solid areas. There are no papillary projections. Uh, the septa are not very thick. Uh, I think then the size would not be very important. Uh, if you have done a good imaging. So, uh, laparoscopy can be okay. offered, uh, definitely, after proper counseling. So, okay. the only uh, problem that we have as oncologists... Do, do you recommend that... staging laparotomy, sir? Yes. Sapna, do you recommend staging laparotomy because it is almost ruled out, malignant chances are ruled out. Can no, We uh, can go for a, say, I mean, a transverse insertion and remove it? Or yeah, that, definitely. Should, we, can, should uh, we go uh, for a staging? Staging would not be required because it's a benign tumor. Okay. Uh, yeah. Confirm it's benign tumor. We can keep the present facilities available and we can go for the. No, even if present section is not available, what we can do is uh, after the tumor has been taken out, you can just cut open this tumor and you find that there are no solid areas, there are no, no, projections, areas no, projections, no capillary projections, then I think you are dealing with a benign tumor. Then present section may not be required. Frozen section is required yes. only when you have a solid tumor inside the cyst. <laughs> yes, so, sir. proper evaluation by, they have done a proper, uh, I mean, imaging, including 3D imaging, and so there was nothing suggestive of any malignancy, thickness, or uh, uh, any uh, excrescence on the surface or inside. Only the size is uh, big, and uh, it is unilateral. So with all those things and the young patient, 
and uh, he is not having. Only thing is, if you leave it further, it may undergo torsion. So far, there was no, it was not possible to have torsion because uterus was also big. So now she can have a torsion at any time because a huge abdomen, lax abdomen, and the uterus is emptied, and now she can go in for a torsion. So that's why I was asking, why not we proceed with a laparotomy or whatever way, remove the tumor? Yes, uh, uh, agreed, Dr. Bab Shikran. And only thing was that if it is such a huge tumor, I would like to ask. So, in that situation, like doing a laparoscopy, I mean, uh, okay, uh, most of the chances are it is that benign. But in the eventuality yeah. that there is a possibility of a malignancy, yeah. and you know, then of course, if they um, there is a spillage Spill during. Occurs. A spill yeah. occurs, the then it's very stage will different. Up, up it will affect the staging. It will affect the staging, and you know, something which will not need chemotherapy but otherwise. Chemotherapy. Uh, yeah. will, you, know, you will make it that she will require chemotherapy. <laughs> yes. You are right. So you are right. That, very good. You know, uh, if uh, this is, and especially these mucin, if it turns out to be mucinous, then even with chemo, yes. that will not respond. So yeah. I think, you know, uh, staging laparotomy with. Uh, uh, I, I mean, but the, pro, uh, the exact but details Bhavna, of the surgical... What you are telling is theoretically correct. But in practice, all over the world, uh, I think uh, all the laparoscopic surgeons would go and do laparoscopy. Okay, because the chance yeah. of malignancy is extremely low when you have a good imaging, maybe 1% or less. And, uh, and nowadays, uh, what we do uh, is during laparoscopy, we uh, have the endobacks. Okay, the tumor is ruptured into the endobag and then delivered by a calpatomy intact. So there is a minimum spillage into the abdominal cavity. So laparoscopy is not an absolute contraindication. Only thing is that you have to counsel the patient regarding the possibility of malignancy and the possibility of the risks of laparoscopy, which is very, very minimum. Yeah, very correct. Why do you not? I think we had a very good discussion. Big yeah. size tumor. Why not? It is mucinous, sir. If it is mucinous, it is a big size tumor. So why not it's mucinous? No, no it's because uh, think, uh, yeah. MRI scan also will give you an idea whether the contents are clear or whether the contents why are will, mucinous. Why will we sir. take this one percent risk? Why will we take no. this one percent risk? No, that's and why I'm telling you. You have to consult the patient. You have to consult the patient. It is twenty no, centimeter, twenty-five centimeter size tumor. Correct, correct. What you're telling is correct. Huh? The risk, I think, uh, the, has to be explained to the patient. Uh, yes, and sir. the patient is not ready to take the risk, then better go ahead with laparotomy. Yes, sir. And that too, it, then it, in that case, it becomes a staging laparotomy, not a, just a laparotomy. It becomes a staging laparotomy is the correct treatment, as Madam was also mentioning. If you want, don't want to take any risk at all in this patient, even though it is appears to be 90 plus percent of benign, but because of the size, and because of the risk of failure. If you want to be absolutely sure and certain, probably it is staging laparotomy. Otherwise, a laparotomy or even a laparoscopy. So all those things are okay in this patient also. So very good uh, suggestions uh, from Dr. Wafina and Dr. I forgot her name. Uh, very good uh, discussion. Yeah, yeah, very good discussion. For the, if at all, there are three PGs also there. So this is the way how to discuss in the examination also. Those who have passed done, this thing okay in the practice also this is the way to go about very good please off the share screen Mahmoud please yeah yeah thank you very much yeah, thank, thank you to all the faculties and I especially like to thank the Mameshi Medical College Hospital even after the they are treating their the facing their the use the hops barding and also the gynae patients and others even after that they are treating and they are trying to manage their cases now i request our scientific secretary dr fm kamaluddin sir to discuss the matter and we um, close the session after giving her his opinion dr fm kamaluddin bhai because our professor dr I mean, hi sir it is around 10 45 pm in bangladesh so sir is feeling sick so sir left i think Dr. Ethan Kamal, Secretary, he will close the session. Kamal, do that, please. Thank you, Shahana. Uh, first of all, thanks for bringing my medical school today. 
because I am from the same secondary school, and uh, I am so proud for uh, the performance of Mimetri School. And thanks to our overseas oh. faculties for giving us so much time, and uh, all the seniors like Dr. Shekhan, Dr. Bhap, Bhapna, and also I, uh, Jaya. So thanks for the support, and your support is the key for continuing this program. And with this interaction, every day we are learning and growing. And you are the team who is helping us to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And everybody are requested to join with us in our Bangladesh International Cancer Congress in 2021 in November. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank, uh, thank you all. Yeah, yeah. Thank <laughs> you.